Okay, well, I hope all of you had a nice lunch. And uh, so I'll uh, continue, and then again, we'll have some time at the end for discussion. There are three main uh, areas of forgiveness that I'm going to cover. I've been primarily talking about forgiving ourselves. So uh, that would be the first thing, uh, forgiving harm that we have caused to ourselves. And again, if we look at the sorts of things that we hold against ourselves, a lot of times it isn't really harm. It's uh, not that you've engaged in non-virtuous actions that harm you, it's that you've just bruised your ego. And, you know, that's not a problem. It's, it, yeah, it's not a problem to bruise your ego. It's your ego that's the problem. In fact, maybe it would, this would be a good time to talk about our ego. And um, so, I'll just go off script here. I don't mean my glasses. <laughs> um, the uh, His Holiness the Karmapa has a very good description of what he calls the fabricated self in the, uh, the heart is noble. Usually in Buddhism they talk about the self or the ego, but uh, he talks, he used the term fabricated self. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like the way he uh, goes into the fabricated self. And the first word here is fabricated. And fabricate can mean a lot of different things. And basically, it can mean to uh, put together, to assemble, like you would fabricate a refrigerator. Uh, the other is to uh, fabricate a lie or fabricate evidence. And the fabricated self is the second. It's something that is put together, but it's totally false. It's totally made up. Uh, and so that's a really important point to, to understand, that this ego, this self that we have, is totally made up. It's a construction that we have put together, and it's just like fabricated evidence or a fabricated lie. But, of course, we believe it. Maybe the Buddha was the original fact checker. <laughs> because he told us that uh, this isn't so, it's, it's a lie. And so the way he describes this fabricated self of ours is that when we are born, we come into the world and we do not even have a name. You know, we're just a little baby there. Uh, and then someone else gives us a name and eventually through association we come to respond to that name. And thinking, well, that's who I am, whatever that name is. And um, as we grow older, then our parents and other people around us tell us things about ourselves that we come to uh, associate with ourselves. At first, uh, from my uh, experience, uh, not as being a one-year-old, but seeing what adults do to one-year-olds is they say, you're cute, <laughs> and so forth. And then uh, you just gradually associate these uh, descriptions and qualities with who you are. 
and uh, and then you explore your world and start uh, uh, making decisions on your own. Uh, and when you get the terrible twos, you start getting told no a lot, <laughs> and you start saying no a lot, <laughs> and you get through them, and then you go on and. But basically, you start pulling things from the environment and from other people around you and use them to define yourself. I like this, I don't like that. This is my mother, that is my brother, and so forth. And um, we frequently um, take on a lot of likes and dislikes from our parents from our siblings, you go to school and the teachers start telling you about things about who you are, who you should be, and so forth. And we keep bringing on more and more things uh, uh, about how we define ourselves from outside of ourselves. And it changes as we grow older. And then uh, uh, you go to high school, you're a teenager, and you go through more changes. There's pre-adolescent psychology, adolescent psychology. They're different. <laughs> there is, then you're an adult. Uh, and um, you behave differently, eventually, than when you were a teenager. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> and um, as we go through the life cycle, we keep changing. Who we think we are keeps changing, and uh, how we respond to things keeps changing. So this self is fabricated, it's put together, it's assembled. As we go along, it keeps changing. And then as you approach old age, and there's uh, uh, gerontology and uh, working with the, uh, the elderly, because they appear, they look at things differently than you did when you were middle-aged, and so forth. So there's nothing there that is constant. There is nothing there that is coming completely from something that is unique to you. You also, of course, bring with you a lot of habitual patterns from your previous karma, your previous lives. But by definition, a habitual pattern is nothing more than a habitual pattern. It's something that is built up over time, and it's something that can change. Uh, we develop a mental conditioning, a certain way of uh, looking at the world, a certain way of looking at ourselves, and so forth. And again, conditioning is just what it uh, says. It's something that we're conditioned to, and uh, when the conditions change, the conditioning changes. What happens is that our conditioning doesn't change right away. Things change. Uh, there's a bend in the tracks or the road, and instead of going that way, we go straight ahead. And that's when we run into problems with our habitual patterns. You know, how did I end up here? <laughs> because the habitual patterns work if you keep doing the same thing under the same conditions, but the conditions are never the same. But that's who the self is that we think we are. It's something that is not permanent. Uh, it is not unchanging. It is influenced by external conditions. Uh, it's uh, not real. It's relative, it depends on conditions and so forth. But the, as I said, the problem is that a lot of times we develop all kinds of negative feelings towards ourselves 
when that uh, fabricated self gets bruised, when we do things that uh, make us look uh, foolish or ignorant or um, out of place, make us feel uncomfortable. But it's not, it's not non-virtuous to make your ego feel uncomfortable. So that's important. Really, it's good to investigate the things that you're holding against yourself and thinking, I'm an idiot, <laughs> or whatever, whatever that troll is telling you. Uh, and to realize that maybe these things aren't all that serious. Uh, this is when you can start laughing at yourself. Um, I, uh, when I started realizing how hard I could be on myself, uh, this was after meditating for a while. I was, I'd come out of depression by this time, but I still had many of the patterns from depression still there. They just weren't operating as a unit to keep me in the depth of depression. And so I hung up a sign on my little cork bulletin board in my kitchen, and it said, the beatings will continue until morale improves the management. <laughs> and uh, uh, what I would do then, of course, is when I would start beating myself up for some trivial little thing, you know, I've damaged my ego, I've offended it, uh, then, uh, and start beating myself up about it, then I would eventually see the sign and realize how silly this was and laugh a little bit. Uh, it isn't exactly forgiveness, but uh, because there really wasn't anything to forgive. You know, I hadn't done anything non-virtuous. Uh, being embarrassed is not a problem. <laughs> it's not non-virtuous. It's actually good. It's good to be embarrassed. It's good to feel shame. <laughs> These are healthy things. Uh, and so uh, it's really important to, to be able to distinguish between what is non-virtuous and what is just a little juvenile the fabricated self acting up, having a tantrum. So forgiveness, this is a way that I think can help understand it. It's like thinking of, um, uh, it's a bit like a bank loan that you've taken out and now the bank says you don't have to repay it. We all like that idea, you know, that so you've done something that uh, you've harmed yourself, maybe, maybe you've just, you've just, you're harmed, your ego even, but you don't have to repay it. Okay, forgive it, forget it, drop it. You don't have to write out any more checks and send them in. It's done, over with. Um, and the way we have been repaying them is with things like anger, shame, guilt, and so forth, which is actually much more painful than writing out a check. Uh, and so we can just drop it, drop the anger, the shame, the guilt. You could look at forgiveness as being like a fresh start. That um, you uh, not only drop the anger and the shame and the guilt, but you also 
as best as you can are motivated to, I'm never going to do this again. Again, beating yourself up will not really make you improve. But if you can treat yourself with kindness and gentleness and love, uh, encouragement, that will help you improve. I used to uh, have horses and uh, and uh, one thing that people will say about horses is that when you're wanting them to do something, first you have to get their attention, you know, and it might mean that you have to slap them or pull on the reins hard once, you know, get their attention. Once you've got their attention, then let them know what you want to do. So if you want to change, you have to first get your attention. But once you've got your attention, uh, calling yourself all kinds of names, beating yourself up mentally with all kinds of anger and guilt and so forth, serves absolutely no purpose. A child won't learn that way. You won't learn that way either. And so, uh, once you've got your attention and realize that you have done something wrong, then take the actions necessary to not do it again. That's all that it takes, and then drop it. Concentrate your energy on improving rather than punishment. I. Um, worked with an inmate that uh, after, uh, I, this was in a Buddhist context, and um, he had met a, practiced meditation for quite a while, and finally he uh, talked to me and he said, um, I know how to break the law. I'm very good at that. What I don't know how, how to do is how to behave in a good way. That's what he needed. Well, punishment doesn't teach an inmate how to behave well. You can punish him all you want to, and it won't help. And it won't help you either. Punishment doesn't work. Uh, and so what works is training yourself and steering yourself in a positive direction. Again, with kindness and gentleness. I like to say, like a loving mother would. A loving mother might have to do something to get the child's attention, to stop doing something harmful, maybe even, you know, yell. Uh, but then after that, gently and with love, guide the child and train the child. That's what we need, is loving guidance. And um, what I came to realize is that I, I, even though I never really had a kind, loving mother, that I could become a kind, loving mother to myself. You know, the, what is virtuous, what is non-virtue, it's very obvious in the teachings. Read the books, study what the Lama says, and, uh, and then apply it. Again, with love, with gentleness, with kindness, and when necessary, then maybe you have to do something to get your attention. But it's just get your attention. Here's an example of how to get a person's attention with love. Uh, now, I was working with inmates, and uh, 
so I, my office looked out on a room that was called the multi, multi-purpose room because it was used for multi-purposes. And uh, as you know, windows are very popular in prisons. They do not like blank, you know, solid walls where you can't see what's going on. And so part of my job was to also keep an eye on what was going on in that room. And uh, uh, all of a sudden I realized there were two groups of inmates in there and they were arguing with each other. And I really didn't know what was going on. So I went out there and I asked, you know, well, what's going on here? And a, two, a guy from each of the groups started talking at me at the same time. And uh, so I just said, you know, stop. I went to, okay, tell me what's going on here. And as soon as this guy talked, this guy talked. <laughs> and I turned to him and I said, shut up. <laughs> okay, go on. <laughs> And he started talking, and this guy started talking immediately. Shut up! <laughs> okay, go on. And he started talking again, and this guy started talking, and I looked at him and I said, Shut up! <laughs> and this guy said, uh, Okay, we'll come back later. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard later through the, uh, the grapevine that my standing among the inmates went up. <laughs> that instead of being this kind little gentle monk, <laughs> that there were some teeth. And uh, the idea, that's what's called wrath. You know, you have to get their attention. And, but it was wrath without anger. You know, I wasn't holding on to it. As soon as I said, shut up, that was it. I was just trying to get their attention. I didn't expect it to end that way, quite honestly. The guys that left were the, guy that, the guys that I preferred to stay there because I knew who they were and this other group and this other guy with a mouth. I didn't know who they were. But anyway, that solved the problem. Uh, and so uh, it, you know, it was done out of kindness rather than I didn't you know, go on and on and on, like what the blank, blank, blank. You can use language like that in prison and get away with an inmate can't, <laughs> but the staff can. I could have sworn at them and called them all kinds of things and yada, 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 yada. But no, it was just, shut up! And then, okay. Then I went back to my office and didn't hold on to it, you know, didn't think, you know, but bad thoughts about these guys. and go over it and over it. And we can be the same way with ourselves. You know, sometimes we need, a, and I've seen Rinpoche do that, by the way. That's who I learned this from. <laughs> I'm not going to say he ever did that to me. <laughs> but yeah, that's a, that's, that's a llama trick. And we can use it on ourselves, you know. Get your attention and then drop it. Drop all the negative feelings and then work with it in a positive way. Um, and uh, actually, I uh, ran into an inmate that was there when I worked there. Uh, and uh, he was driving the shuttle that I was taking uh, back from the airport. And uh, I did not recognize the man, but he uh, took me aside before we got on the shuttle, he said, I want to talk to you. And I said, come over here. You know, so I did, and he identified himself. And he, um, uh, he was a Christian, and there was a Christian chaplain there. Now, I was a chaplain that was Buddhist, but I left <coughs> the, ch the Christian activities. I primarily left the Christian chaplain to supervise. But I did have contact with this man. And uh, so he had a lot of nice things to say for me. Uh, about me, but what he said really, um, uh, the, the one thing that he said that really uh, was meaningful to me was, he said that one thing that us inmates could tell about you was that you cared about us. And um, let yourself know that you care about yourself you know, that you care about yourself. 
that's really important uh, that uh, that you think that you're worthy of being cared for uh, and respect yourself, respect the way you talk to yourself, the way you think about yourself, and be interested in your happiness rather than your punishment. So, um, to go on here, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about karma. And uh, karma is very simply cause and effect. The, um, the Tibetan word for karma means action. And uh, so when any action of body, speech, and mind will leave a seed, a trace, behind in our consciousness. And when the conditions are right, then that seed will sprout, grow, and bear fruit. And the uh, Tibetans say that if you plant barley, you will harvest barley. If you plant poisonous seeds, you will harvest poisonous seeds. Now, what I found interesting about that when I first ran into that is I was brought up Christian, and in the Bible it says, as you sow, so shall you reap. Sounds to me like karma. <laughs> but we're not going to have an interfaith dialogue here. <laughs> but I think you'll find something like this in uh, all of the world religions. that. Uh, uh, we, we don't get a, uh, a get-out-of-jail card free, that our actions, we become responsible for the results of our actions. And uh, so what that means is we need to be mindful about our actions and mindful of how our actions um, affect other people and mindful of how uh, other people's actions uh, affect us. Now, we just ate uh, a, a wonderful meal. There were a lot of people that work at that restaurant that were responsible for us to get that wonderful meal. It wasn't just going in there, eating, paying for it, and getting out. That uh, all kinds of people had to work for us to eat. And then the food had to be delivered to the restaurant. Farmers had to grow it, somebody had to pick it, it had to be processed, transported, and so forth. And then there was all kinds of machinery that would have to be produced to grow the food. That uh, there, had, there were seed companies that produced the seed and on and on and on, companies that produce the machinery, companies that produce the fertilizer, the fuel. Uh, and then there was a lot of machinery in that restaurant. Runs on electricity and probably natural gas and who knows what all else fuels. Uh, and all the people that did things to make that meal possible, they all have families. They all need food, clothing, and shelter themselves, and health care. And so there are people involved in providing that for all these people. And when you look at it that way, just that one meal, we essentially touch the whole planet. It's called interdependence, that uh, we really touch the whole world by eating that one meal. And you could say we have a karmic connection to everybody. In a way, when you look at it that way, it's, it's a good thing that our actions um, have a ripple effect, that they uh, 
spread out and touch uh, uh, eventually everybody in some way or another, and that we too are not a separate individual like this fabricated self thinks, and that we can have gratitude towards all these different people that have done things that we've benefited from in some slight little way. So um, there can, there's also such a thing as a karmic debt, and that is where we have done something to harm another person, and uh, therefore there is a karmic debt that we owe that person. And when you get into some of the Vajrayana practices in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, there, there are actually uh, things that you can do uh, uh, to um, um, fulfill that karmic debt, besides that being later on uh, causing you to suffer, you know, getting even. A little side, I'm going to give you a little uh, language lesson here. Uh, as I said, Tibetan is the word for uh, action is lay. So I'm going to teach you the uh, Tibetan word for laziness. And I, I know that even the most language challenged person he'll, here will remember it. It's called lay low. <laughs> and that is a Tibetan word for laziness. Lay low. Yep, it's lazy. That's laziness. So you, you see now you learned a little bit here. Um, now, what makes karma the most powerful is that there are three elements that need to be present. The first is intention to do the deed. If you cause some harm to yourself or other people, but there was not an intention to do it, uh, it's not nearly as serious. The same thing if it's a beneficial action. If you accidentally help somebody, it's not nearly as much good karma as if you had the intention to help them. The second is the actual act, uh, whatever the act is, either beneficial or harmful. It's said that blinking the eye is a neutral act. It is neither a beneficial or a harmful act. And the third element is rejoicing. Being uh, pleased and happy with the uh, having completed the act. So if you have the intention to uh, swat a fly, and then you swat it, and then you're really happy that you swatted it and killed it, that would be the most serious uh, karma from killing a fly. But if, uh, for instance, uh, you're just waving your hand around and all of a sudden it ends up on a fly accidentally, uh, that isn't nearly as serious. And then when you're, when you're done with that, if you go, oh, I didn't intend that, uh, again, uh, that greatly diminishes the, uh, the amount of karma that you accumulate from killing an insect. And so it's that way with all actions. The, the, uh, very quickly, the 10 non-virtuous actions, there's three of body, which is killing, uh, killing humans uh, is considered the most serious because the human realm beings are most likely to be able to receive teachings in the Dharma, uh, practice, and actually progress along the path. Uh, and then the next is stealing, taking that which is not freely given. Taking things out of deception would be included in that. And again, remember the intention to steal, 
the actually doing it and then rejoicing in it. Then uh, sexual misconduct is the third action, negative action of body. And this actually gets quite complicated. I guess that's an indication of how complicated sex gets. <laughs> but it means um, having sex outside of a committed relationship. It means, uh, it, you know, so you don't have to be married, but it should be a committed relationship, not just casual sex. Um, uh, and uh, so outside of a committed relationship, having sex with somebody that is underage, uh, and underage is cultural. Even, it can even vary in this country from state to state. Uh, so don't break the law. <laughs> uh, again, this is an indication of relative truth. You know, this is not absolute, this is relative. Uh, and then having sex with someone that has uh, taken vows of celibacy. So having sex with a monk or a nun. And there are also lay vows of celibacy too. And then having uh, sex with somebody who does not consent. And then having sex with somebody who it would harm them physically or psychologically. Those are basically, like I said, it's complicated. Um, then there are four actions of speech that are negative. The first is lying, just telling, saying things that aren't true. Uh, and by the way, these are guidelines. For instance, it would be all right to lie if, uh, like where I live, there's a lot of deer hunting, and you see some deer go by that way, and then here comes a group of guys with guns. Where did the deer go? Oh, they went that way. You know, that's virtuous lying. <laughs> so you have to remember this. Uh, so then, lying is the first non virtuous action of speech. The second one is creating disharmony, especially within the Sangha. You know, so this would be saying things that would cause relationships to break up or weaken. And the uh, third is harsh words, harsh speech. If you bring things to a painful point, you are wrong even if you're right. This is a difficult one. But uh, avoiding harsh speech, and by the way, saying no isn't harsh speech. Again, if I would rattle on at a very loud voice uh, negatively, that would be harsh speech. But here I'm just, in that case, trying to get the person's attention. Uh, so using foul language, you know, loud, argumentative, and so forth. Even if you're right, you're wrong. And the last one is called gossip, and uh, sometimes it's called idle chit-chat. In um, the Rinpoche's most recent book, Excellent in the Beginning, it goes into these ten. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, actually, I have some here, and I feel another one coming right behind it. <laughs> so here we'll uh, do something about that. For some reason or another, I, to the best of my knowledge, it's not an allergy, but all of a sudden, Every once, well, I, it happens at it happens at home in the winter time. All of a sudden, something, and I sneeze. I was worried though about sneezing, holding a cup of tea in my hand because it could get complicated. 
Uh, anyway, um, <coughs> here it comes again. Maybe it is Florida. Um, idle chit chat is just mindless compulsive talking and not really saying anything. Or uh, also you could, he says, uh, spilling your heart out to someone that really shouldn't be hearing these things. Uh, when I read that, I thought of the, the uh, bartender. <laughs> you know, people get a few drinks in them and all of a sudden the bartender becomes a therapist. <laughs> and uh, here's all kinds of things. So um, I attended a teaching where Rinpoche talked on these ten non-virtuous actions. And uh, after going over these four of speech, there was time for Q&A and a man asked, but that would eliminate all normal conversation. <laughs> and I learned something about Rinpoche, uh, and that was that he laughed before anybody else, and it wasn't translated. <laughs> that his English is better than you might think. But uh, no, this does not eliminate all normal conversation, but it does eliminate a huge amount of conversation. But it is possible to have a conversation and still follow those guidelines. And actually people will respect you more and you'll be more trustworthy if you do not engage in those four types of uh, negative actions of speech. And then there are three of mind. Uh, one is uh, envy and jealousy. And I think that's pretty obvious uh, that uh, you see something that somebody else has and you are envious and want to possess it. And uh, I have joked with my neighbor, I tell the guy with the jackasses, he's a Christian and I say, you know, the Tenth Commandment is, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's ass. <laughs> and I say, I do not covet your ass. <laughs> in fact, there have been times that I wished he would sell them all. <laughs> like about two o'clock in the morning, right, Lama? Yes. <laughs> they're very loud. Are, are there coyotes? Or oh, yes, they're you know, coyotes. So they're probably you know about jackasses. <laughs> I think they're good for keeping coyotes away from the exactly. exactly. They're very territorial uh, and very loud, and that's how they chase them away. Exactly. So anyway, <laughs> don't covet your neighbor's ass. <laughs> uh, and, um, and then there is ill will, and that is wishing that harm come to somebody. Yeah, I know. You know, and, and it gets really difficult, especially in times of elections like this year. Uh, or let's just say uh, uh, some uh, dictator that's slaughtering his people, like Assad. You know, you, it would seem almost virtuous to, well, why doesn't lightning strike? Uh, but no, we're not wishing that people like that uh, uh, get killed. Um, we're wishing that they would wake up and realize how harmful their behavior is. Uh, and then the last one is um, uh, wrong view. And uh, that is, maybe it is Florida. <laughs> yeah. If this continues, I do have some ant, uh, allergy medicine in the back that I travel with. Uh, anyway, um, wrong view is just uh, denying um, uh, the, uh, the basic Buddhist ideas and teachings. It would be like saying that uh, uh, there really car there isn't such a thing as karma that you don't have to be responsible for your actions that your actions won't cause you to suffer in the future or cause if it's good karma uh, a better future for you and, and things like that or you 
There's no such thing as a Buddha. That it's impossible to be enlightened. It's all a big a made up story, a myth. So those are the non-virtuous actions. And uh, so avoid those. And then uh, again, you c might engage in them. And if you do, then the confession and purification that I talked about last night. And uh, ideally, what you're going to be doing is Nundro, and the second section of Nundro is a confession and purification practice. And I happen to know a Lama that can teach Nundro, that lives in Gainesville. <laughs> We have a number of people doing Nendro now, yeah. but of course, if anyone's interested in that, I mean, I'm, yeah. but that is one of the four practices that we do for devotion and purification and accumulating the merit and the opening the mind with the guru. These are all called preliminary practices, which set the mind in the right order for Dhamma. Yeah, so... Uh, and also, he could give you their other short purification prayers that you could do, very short. If you go to uh, Kathy Wesley's site, she has a teaching, and I think the prayer on it, but again, Lama Losong here, he can give you more guidance too. Uh, so, the important thing is uh, to, uh, first of all, try to avoid having the intention to engage in any of these non-virtuous actions. Uh, and then uh, try to avoid the actions themselves, and then definitely uh, avoid rejoicing in having concluded any of these ten actions. But besides the confession and purification, then also forgive yourself. Don't hold on to it. Don't, you might say, uh, nag yourself about it. Well, I keep doing this over and over and over and over again. I'm a very bad person. Forgive yourself, too. Forgive yourself. Let go of it. Hold on to the resolve not to do it again but let go of punishing yourself. And uh, so uh, the forgiveness is giving up wanting to punish yourself. Uh, so, uh, let me see here. We're going to do a little forgiveness exercise here in a minute. But uh, uh, before we do that, I guess I want to make one other point here. And that is the difference between our Buddha nature, who we are ultimately, and our behavior. And so uh, forgiveness has to do with our behavior. But our behavior cannot alter our Buddha nature. If we constantly engage in uh, these ten negative actions of body, speech, and mind, it doesn't change our Buddha nature one bit. All it does is bury it deeper. The analogy is the sun and the clouds. The sun being our Buddha nature, the clouds being our negative karma and our obscurations. All that it does is just make the clouds thicker. And uh, engaging in virtuous actions, which are the opposite of these 10 negative actions, that makes the clouds thinner. But it's still clouds. It's the Buddha nature that is untouched. There's a huge distance between the sun and the clouds. The clouds do not affect the sun one bit. And so it's really important that uh, we are working at the cloud level here, rather than the level of the Buddha nature.
So there is a huge difference between uh, our ultimate nature and our behavior. And forgiveness is at the level of our behavior. So now we're going to do a little exercise very similar to the one we did this morning. And then we'll have a little chance to uh, talk about it afterwards. Um, and again, what we're doing here is we're trying to give ourselves some space to grow in the future so that we can change and transform and go beyond where we are right now. And this particular exercise I actually talked to Rinpoche about. The one we did this morning I did not talk to Rinpoche about. It's, uh, but this one we're going to do I did talk to about and got his okay. And since he okayed this, I thought the one I did this morning would be okay too. Because uh, I did not get this from any book that I read. It was just, well, this seemed like a good exercise to do for forgiveness. In actuality, you don't usually, it's unusual to run across the word forgiveness in Tibetan Buddhism. They talk about confession and purification. But in the heart is noble, his holiness talks about it. And you might say that was the inspiration for presenting it this way, is that he talks about it in that book. And he says that you have to be able to forgive yourself before you can forgive others. 